Anyone who read comic books in the 70s will surely have nostalgic memories for the hostess ads that were featured in nearly every comic book published during that time. In 1975, Hostess began an ambitious ad campaign that would feature characters from various comic book companies in one-page stories endorsing Hostess snacks. Starting with the Batman story in 1975 and running until 1981, fans would see characters from Marvel, DC, Archie, Harvey Comics, and even Gold Key licensed characters of the time such as Bugs Bunny shamelessly hawking Hostess fruit pies, Twinkies, and cupcakes. Interestingly, there was one unique restriction placed on these ads. While Marvel and DC characters could show for the products, Hostess would not allow the stories to feature the heroes actually eating the Hostess snacks, because it would then appear that the heroes were endorsing eating the snacks. Although why this is a problem, I don't know. Maybe they were afraid it looked like Superman would be endorsing Twinkies and parents would complain? But if he's in the ad, what difference would that make? I did find out after looking through many, many, many Hostess ads for this video, that the Incredible Hawk clearly didn't have that restriction, nor did any of the Dodd superhero characters. So it's possible this is some sort of urban legend, but they may have also just held the superheroes to a different standard than, say, Archie or Casper, and they made an exception with the Hawk because he's more of a mindless monster. Exactly how many of these ads were published is unclear, but at least 352 of them have been accounted for with everyone from Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Captain America, Archie, and Josie of Josie and the Pussycats hawking Hostess fruit snacks. Even Richie Rich got in on it. Although I'm not sure why he's hawking for Hostess, he sure doesn't need the buddy. Even some B-list characters like Green Arrow, Captain Marvel, and Plastic Man got in on the action. Incidentally, one of these stories featured Thor and it was called the Diga League Family, which I just wanted to mention because I thought it was hilarious. These ads have become somewhat iconic to comic fans, particularly the Marvel and DC ads due to their absurdity of the heroes somehow always stopping a threat by using Hostess fruit pies or Twinkies. While these comics did feature named comic book heroes, very few of them featured actual supervillains from the comics. There were some exceptions, such as the Red Skull for Marvel and Penguin for DC Comics, but in most stories, the heroes would face off against a one-off villain who would launch a nefarious, and often silly, and sometimes nonsensical plot, be defeated due to their unhealthy love for the host of snack cakes, and then never be seen again. Well, in most cases, they were never seen again. While it is worth noting, the Spider-Man hostess ad featured a character named Madam Web that, while much different from the Madam Web that eventually showed up in the comics, probably was inspired by her hostess counterpart. But another more direct crossover character from Hostess ads was Icemaster, who appeared in a human torch story titled The Icemaster Cometh, written by copywriter Tony Machia, who oversaw the Hostess ads at the time, with art by Frank Miller, the soon-to-be legendary comic book writer and artist, had recently been brought on for his highly influential run in Daredevil that largely defined the characters he's known today. But in between Do and Daredevil, Miller also found time to draw this comics ad for Hostess. The evil villain Ice Master was freezing New York City in an attempt to start a new Ice Age. Ambitious plan, I gotta say. Hostess apparently wanted to name the villain Ice Man, but Miller changed it on his own because, well, that name was taken. After briefly trying to stop Ice Master, which had to be brief because, well, it was a one-page story, Torch failed and decided to try another strategy. Give him Hostess fruit pies, which would apparently warm him from the inside out. Okay. Ice Master took the bait, and apparently eating them caused the city to warm up, and Torch, I guess, just flew off and didn't go back for him. Okay, now obviously that's a goofy ending, but the purpose of this was to sell Hostess snacks not to tell a compelling story. And distracting or defeating a villain with hostess snacks was basically the solution to almost all of these stories, at least the superhero ones. Either way, the story was published and it would seem that that would be the end of Ice Master and his ill-fated supervillain career. He had high ambitions but was overcome by his own sweet tooth. A tale as old as time, really. But it turned out that wouldn't be the end at all. Far from it, in fact. For in 1999, around 20 years later, Ice Master would return in issue 24 of Thunderbolts by Kirk Busiek and Mark Bagley, which featured the team of former supervillains encountering a new version of the Masters of Evil, led by villainous Crimson Cow, who had assembled a whopping 25 supervillains to make up the new team. 
Somewhat of a meta joke is this setup for the 25th issue of the series. Among the villains was Ice Master, who had now been made canon. Although if anyone thinks that meant an explanation to how he got his powers or any backstory would come out of it, it didn't. His past and origins are a mystery to this day. In an interview with Back Issue Magazine, Busiak mentioned he thought it would be fun to include a villain from the Hostess ads among the lineup of this new Masters of Evil. As for why it was Ice Master, Busiak said, Most of the original Marvel Hostess villains are kind of stupid, which is fine for what they were, but I wanted someone who could be believable as a regular Marvel supervillain. Ice Master looks cool, has perfectly sensible powers, and didn't wield scissor spoons or forget me net. So Ice Master it was. Ice Master only appeared in the final page of issue 24 with other members, but had a slightly larger role in issue 25. I say slightly and that he got one line before the Thunderbolts took him out in the big battle against the heroes and villains. Or actually, if it was the Thunderbolt, I guess it was against the villains and villains? I don't know. He wouldn't show up again until 2011 in the miniseries Fear Itself, The Homefront, a tie-in to the Fear Itself event series. The miniseries featured several stories, but Ice Master would appear in the speedball story of the series. An excellent story about the strength we can find in ourselves in the darkest crisis. Written by Christos Gage, with pencils by Mike Mayhew. Which I highly recommend anyone who hasn't checked it out does. It features Speedball returning to Stamford, Connecticut, a town where Speedball's recklessness accidentally got 600 people killed back in Civil War. The Marvel Events series, not the war between the North and the South, if anyone's actually confused. Ice Master would appear in part two of the story. In the main Fear Itself story, Juggernaut, being possessed by the Asgardian Kurth, destroyed the prison known as the Raft, a prison for superpower beings that Ice Master presumably been in since being defeated in Thunderbolts. Along with fellow prisoners Ember, Aftershock, and Whirlwind, he made his way to Stanford, raiding hell on the town. Speedball stepped in to try to stop the supervillains, but was actually defeated by them. Although I don't know if Ice Master can take much credit, as he was pretty sadly taken out early in the fight. Although there was a nice end joke when the villains left about how Ice Master should have loaded up on the fruit pies they stole on the way, an obvious reference to his original appearance. He then made a couple very brief cameo appearances in Herc No. 3 and Thunderbolts 158, both of which, while published after the speedball fight, actually showed in more detail the prison escape that happened prior to that. Although Ice Master only appeared in one panel in Herc, and a slightly bigger role in Thunderbolts, although by that I mean he had one line and two panels, instead of one panel and no lines. He was coming up in the world. Incidentally, that's the theme of pretty much Ice Master's entire comics career. Less is more, or so he hopes. His next appearance with any meeting was Avengers Academy number 20. The threat from fear itself vanquished, Speedball gathers up members of the Avengers Academy and goes after Ice Master, Aftershock, and Ember. The fight is brief as super-powered Briggs uses his molecular ulti powers to change Ice Master's ice into water, which then causes Aftershock's electric powers to lose control and electrocute Ember before Aftershock is then defeated by Briggs, turning her clothes into Carafetnil. It was not a battle for the ages, let me tell you that. It's around this time I was thinking, when this dude first appeared, he was threatening the entire world with the new Ice Age. Human Torch defeating him sure did mess with his confidence. Ice Master showed up next in the first X-Man Legacy series, and of all things, the last issue of that run, which was written by Christos Gage, making this his third time writing the character as he also wrote the Speedball story and the Avengers Academy issue, and penciled by David Baldion. The story revolved around a group of inmates breaking out of a cell block they were being kept in after being captured, which unlike the Raft was not equipped to handle supervillains. With most of the X-Men off on a field trip with their students, it fell on Rogue and Mimic to stop them and keep them from breaking out the rest of the prisoners. As such, the two X-Men went up against a bunch of second-rate villains with Ice Master among their ranks and they, wait for it, made short work of him in the ensuing battle. I know I just said it, but he once almost caused an Ice Age. This has become an embarrassing. Who knew Hawk and Cheap Snack Cakes would be the height of one's career? It's a public service announcement, kids. Don't eat junk food. His last appearance, as of this writing, was issue 17 of Gambit's fifth series. Funnily enough, the last issue of that series also. Beating up Ice Master was starting to become something the X-Men do on their way out. Which meant, sadly for this video, I had to read a Gambit comic which was not an easy thing to do because, 
and this is the hottest take I've ever had on this channel, I do not like Gambit. Yeah, I said it. I think he's annoyed, and I don't find his shtick interesting at all. I recognize I'm the minority with this opinion, but getting with Rogue isn't enough to win me over. Sorry. But for this video, I read it anyway. The things I do for you guys. The story had Gambit tricked into fighting himself in the middle of a prison riot. I'm sensing a pattern here. Maybe we should see if MCU has had more recent prison riots or breakouts. If not, then I solved the mystery of why we haven't seen Ice Master lately. That seems to be wherever he makes his big move. But anyway, the trap leaves Gambit at the mercy of a man named Boria Chick, who offers a group of inmates a million dollars to the first one to kill Gambit. Among the inmates, Ice Master. Ice Master gets the first shot at Gambit, but fails because of course he does. However, the rest of the prisoners gain the upper hand and almost have Gambit killed. I do love that whenever Ice Master is part of a group that almost wins, they do it after Ice Master gets laid out. He clearly is the weak link. But their seeming victory is short-lived because reinforcements soon arrive in the form of British superhero group MI-13 and the Avengers Unity Division come to the rescue and save Gambit. MI-13 leader Pete Wisdom gets the honor of delivering the knockout blow to Ice Master. Or hell, he might have delivered the killing blow for all we know because that was the last we've seen of him at the time of this recording. I do want to mention here, since I can't think of anywhere else to bring it up, the Marvel Wiki mentioned Ice Master's real name being Bradley Croon. That name wasn't mentioned in any of his comic book appearances I read, which I believe is all of them, and I didn't like see it on a cell door or anything that I noticed. I believe this information comes from the official handbook to the Marvel Universe A to Z update from 2010, but I wasn't able to find a copy of that issue, and I checked every comic shop in town, and it's not available to buy digitally, so sadly I can't confirm this. I can confirm if that is correct, that's the only information we have on Ice Master, is nothing about his past or the origin of his powers was revealed. We know from Avengers Academy he's apparently a human underneath the ice, which would presumably rule out him being some kind of an ice demon or theories along those lines, but beyond that we really don't know anything. Either way, it would seem Ice Master had a pretty uneventful career that seemed mostly defined by his ability to be part of ill-fated prison riots and mass prison escapes, and his weakness is apparently Hostess Fruit Pies. Clearly the most interesting thing about the guy is his unlikely jump from a villain in a Selly Hostess Fruit Pies ad to a legitimate, if not very successful, villain in the Bay Marvel continuity, also known as Earth 616. But still, he went from selling Hostess Fruit Pies to take it on the X-Man. When looked at it like that, he could at least claim an award for most improved. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video. You can check this playlist for more obscure comic book history videos, and you can also check here for the most recent video. I'm Dan the Man, and I'll see you next time.